Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. If you are new to Aviano Baptist or just because of COVID had been away for a while, um, let me just kind of remind you of what's going on here. We, we strive to be a place where your background is not that important. We want you to find authentic Christian community here. And so the questions you have about Jesus or what your church upbringing was or your hurts, your habits, your hangups, none of that stuff is all that terribly relevant. What we want to do is we want to come alongside you and help you come to know and love Jesus more and see the difference he can make in your life so that when he sends us out of here or even during the time he has us here that we can go out into the community and lead others to see the, the difference that Jesus can make in their lives. So we're glad you're here this morning. We're glad we have the opportunity for us to come together. And let me just kind of bring your attention to a couple of announcements. So uh, again, for those who've been out for a little while, um, we use a lot, um, we spend a lot of time in the YouVersion Bible app. And so if you are not a user of that, let me encourage you to become a user of that. And we use it kind of as a church app on Sunday morning. So you'll find a lot of stuff in there, service-related stuff. Our announcements, our information on how to give electronically is in there. A link to the downloadable uh, sermon note-taking guide is available in there. There's a link to our community-wide Bible reading plan. And so we just started a new one called Epic. And it's, it's a four-part plan, and it's focusing on the historical narratives in the Bible, but it really is a story about how God has revealed himself to, to mankind. And so we just started four or five days ago, so if you're interested in jumping in that, um, the, I'll send you the link. I put it up on Facebook a week or so ago, but I'll send you the link to that if you're interested in joining in. But you find all that stuff in version. Uh, we also send out the announcements via email on the Facebook page on the WhatsApp group. So if you're not connected to one of those means, you're not getting the announcements electronically somehow, Come tell me about that after the service, and I'll get you connected to one or all of those platforms so you can see what's going on. So let me just mention a couple of the announcements. Let me find them first. Let me mention a couple of the announcements that are going on. Tonight at 5.30, we're having our next sweet summertime fellowship over at our house. It's a dessert fellowship, um, and so there, you can still sign up. There's a Sign Up Genius doobie whopper there on the Facebook page. So there's still time to sign up for that. So if you want to come tonight, 530 at our house, just jump on there, sign up. Let us know how many are coming. Let us know what you're bringing. If you got questions. Ashley's our fellowship coordinator. She can tell you everything you ever wanted to know about that and every other fellowship. But we do hope you can join us tonight. There's no agenda other than just eating dessert before dinner. And it's okay because it's a church thing, so you can do that. Um, we're going to come together and just enjoy spending time with each other. So I hope you can join us tonight at 530. If you can come, bring a blanket or a, a beach chair or something to sit on. We only have a couple of those, so bring those to sit on. Um, the weather is a little bit, I don't know, iffy today. So we'll make a weather call this afternoon. It's been sort of on, and on again, off again, whether it's supposed to rain this afternoon or not. So we'll make a weather call about 3 or, three or 4 o'clock this afternoon, so keep your eye out on Facebook. But I do hope you can join us tonight at 5.30. 26th of September, we are hosting a marriage night. Now, to be in the afternoon, it's going to be 3 to 6.30, so it'll be marriage afternoon for us. But we're, we're tying into a Right Now Media simulcast. And some of the speakers that will be featured in that event, Matt and Lauren Chandler, um, Conway and Jada Edwards, and Les and Leslie Parrott, three, three amazing couples that are really going to challenge us to, to be the husbands and wives that God's called us to be. So I hope you can join us for that. The link to sign up for that is on the Facebook page. I'll put up another reminder about it this afternoon if you haven't signed up. And we're not going to have child care for that event, and that's, that's kind of by design. So that since you have to hire a sitter anyway to come to that, just hire them for a few more hours and then have a date night afterwards. So you and your spouse can go out afterwards and talk about some of the stuff that you learned, talk about some of the stuff that you just talked about, how you apply that in your marriage. It's 15 bucks a person, $30, $30 a couple. But if that's an issue, if the cost of that would keep you from coming, come tell me. Tell me privately, shoot me a private message, whatever. Come tell me, we'll cover the cost of it. Because I know you, if we're encouraging you to have dinner out and have a sitter and all that, so that $30 might just put you over the edge. And if that's the case, that's fine. Just come and tell me. I don't want that to be the thing that keeps you from coming. So I do hope you can join us. There's a lot of information there in the announcements about marriage night coming up on the 26th of September. Chelsea Hancock, our outreach coordinator, is the point of contact for that. And her, there's a link for, to contact her there as well. 
Pastor's Bible study is happening Tuesdays at 5.30 via Zoom. I also post, we record it, and then I post it up on YouTube afterwards. So if you can't make it on Tuesday at 5.30, you can jump in and watch it later on. Right now, we're going through a short series, What is the Bible and How to Study the Bible? And we're going to finish that up this Tuesday. And then after that, we're going to talk about some of those skills that we just learned, and we're going to dive into one of the books of the Bible. So I hope you can join us Tuesdays at 5.30 via Zoom. I put the link up every week so you can, you can jump in. Um, or, or catch it on YouTube if you can't make it there live on Tuesdays. And then just a reminder, there in the announcements, there's a lot of opportunities to serve. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that here in the message in just a few moments. But there's always a lot of opportunities for you to use the gifts and the abilities that God has given you. So take a look at that list. Some of those needs are, some of our, our ministry teams have been pretty well gutted because of PCSs. So there's a lot of needs on there. Some of them are listed as urgent. So take a look at those and, and just be in, be in prayer. Lord, where do you want me to plug in? Where do you want me to serve? Um, and then come talk to me. Come let me know. And if you feel like the Lord has gifted you to serve in a way that's not on that list, that's not an all-inclusive list there. So if you feel like the Lord has gifted you to serve in a way that's not there, you come tell me that and we'll find a way to get you plugged in. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. Glad we have the opportunity to worship together. Let me just mention this. We, because things are starting to open up and, and we... And our restrictions are starting to loosen around the, the uh, city and around the community. While we're seated in church, you can slide your mask down. So I should have said that before the announcements. Um, so during the announcements time, during the sermon, you can slide it down. You don't have to wear it. Whenever we're standing, so when we're singing, coming in, going out, using the bathroom, whenever we're standing up, slide the mask back up. But when we're seated, you can slide it down if you want. You can leave it up if, you, if you're more comfortable with that, but you have the freedom to slide it down if you want to. Well, we're glad you're here this morning, glad we have the opportunity to worship together. And so now I'm going to ask you to slide that mask right back up again. And let's stand and spend some time and sing some praises to our Lord. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. We really appreciate having you here to worship and learn about God with us. Uh, before we get started, please just bow your head and pray with me if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together to be able to fellowship and to learn more about you and your word. I pray that you please just help prepare our minds and our hearts for worship and for what you have to bring through Pastor Barry. I pray that you speak through him like you normally do. I pray that you help prepare our hearts and minds to receive the word that you've prepared for us this, uh, this morning. And um, I pray that you help us not to be distracted by the things that are around us, Lord. Um, there are so many things always looking to take our attention away from you, and I pray that you help us just in this moment, that your spirit be here, that you help us just to, to truly use this time to commune with you, Lord God, and to grow closer to you, so that when we leave this place, we are refreshed and ready to live out a life that is honoring to you for the, you know, for the rest of our lives, Lord. Amen. But uh, we love you and we praise you. In your precious son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.
be seated. Thank you, as always, praise team. If you came in after the announcement, while, during the message, if you want to pull your mask down, you're certainly welcome to do that. And a big sigh of relief, right? <sighs> Man, it is a little, air conditions are going, but the door is open, so it is a little warm in here. How many of y'all, how many of y'all know who Pastor Francis Chan is? If you've not heard of him, only a couple of you have not heard of him, uh, Francis Chan pastored a large church in Simi Valley, California for many years, founded the church, pastored that church for many years. He's now, he and his family are ministering in Hong Kong. And he's written a couple of very powerful books that have been used by many people in their walk with Christ. Uh, the first book he wrote, 2008, uh, was a book called Crazy Love. Um, and it's a book that really celebrates, as the title suggests, really celebrates God's sort of amazing, outlandish love for us. And then he followed that up with a book called Forgotten God. And the challenge is for churches, a lot of churches that really seem to miss the biblical ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so these two books have been very instrumental, used in a lot of people's lives. Francis Chan is an incredible teacher of God's Word, and he preached a sermon a couple of years ago called Popular Lies Churchgoers Believe. And there's a lot of them, even folks who come to church on a regular basis, some lies that society tells us, and, and you hear them often enough, and the temptation is, well, if you hear it often enough, yeah, eventually you may start to even believe it. Some of the popular lies he, he mentioned that, uh, that churchgoers believe. One is that all of mankind is basically good. And this is the message of society. It strikes very much against the, the message of the Bible, but that all society, all mankind is basically good. At, at worst, we're blank slates when we're born. And so then the, the, the course of our lives, the things that we do, good or bad, will determine whether we are ultimately good people or bad people. But that we start out basically good. It is society that turns us. But the Bible paints a very different picture of mankind. That we come into this world as sinners, but that's one of the lies. Mankind is basically good. Another one of them is this. All religions are pretty much the same. So it doesn't really matter. You know, you hear this around society. Well, they all have some similar teachings, so they're all pretty much the same. It doesn't make any difference. Take your pick, whatever one you like. All roads lead to heaven anyway. It doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you're sincere, God will honor it. You've heard that lie, no doubt. But the Bible says very differently. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. You want to go to heaven. You want to come to the Father. You've got to go through me. Another one of the lies that churchgoers believe. A third one is this, a, a loving God would never allow anyone to spend eternity in hell. And we talk about the love of God, and rightfully so, we ought to. His book, Crazy Love, this outlandish love that God has for mankind. And in fact, the scripture defines God. God is love. You want to know what love looks like, just look at God. That's what it looks like. And yes, God is a God of perfect love, but he's also a God of perfect justice. And in justice, he can't ignore sin. He can't turn a blind eye and say, you know what, I love him so much, it's okay. I'll just let it go. I'll just, I'll just sort of ignore it and pretend it's not there. He can't do that. God can't turn a blind eye to sin. And in his perfect justice, those who spend their lives and, and just consistently reject God, the only just thing to do is to allow eternity to look exactly the same way, and eternity separated from him. And these are lies that churchgoers, regular people who are in church every Sunday, many of them believe these lies. And I'll add one to Francis Chan's list. And that is this. The things that you've done in life are so horrible, or there's so many of them, the list is so long that God couldn't possibly love you, or he couldn't possibly use you. Maybe, he'll, maybe he could love you, but he certainly couldn't use you. That list of things that you've done is so bad, or it's so long that God has no place for you. He couldn't love you. He couldn't use you. And you could almost say that this morning's message maybe is part two from last week. If, if you haven't been here because of COVID for a little while, we have been going through a sermon series called Heroes of the Faith. And we've been looking at many of the heroes. We spent several weeks looking at several Old Testament heroes of the faith. And then a few weeks ago, we moved into the New Testament. Last week, we were looking at Peter. That, that apostle Peter, the one who was so powerful in the opening chapters of the book of Acts to really help establish God's church, and God used in an amazing way. But we also know Peter's amazing failures. 
denying Christ three times right before that he, he was used so powerfully in establishing the church. And we looked last week at how Peter was failed but not finished. And this could almost be part two of that message this morning as we're looking at another hero of the faith, a man that we call the Apostle Paul. And so take out your Bible or open up the Bible app on your device if that's, where you're, that's what you're using this morning. And turn with me to Acts chapter 9. We're looking at Paul's experience, particularly there on the road to Damascus. Now, I don't know if you knew this about Paul, but when we think of the Apostle Paul, if you spent any time in church, hearing the Bible preached, hearing the Bible taught, you know a few things about Paul, right? Just a couple, maybe. And the things we think about Paul, this amazing man of faith, right? This, this prolific church planter, this man who wrote a third of the New Testament. Now, all of those things are true about Paul, but I don't know if you knew this, he wasn't always the Apostle Paul. That wasn't always, you couldn't always say those things were true about his life. In fact, he's got a very checkered past, and we're going to look at that a little bit this morning. But yet, how God used him, in spite of that checkered past, is the title of the sermon. If God can use Paul, he can use me. So you've got your Bible open, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. I'm going to read it. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I put it up there last week. You had a pretty long passage to put up there last week. And I put the passage up there, and from here to that screen right there, I couldn't read the letters. I mean, they were just too tiny. I thought, there is no way I'm putting 20 verses up there. You would not be able to read one letter of that. It would be like an eye test, you know, better or worse, about the same. So I thought, just, just follow along, and I'll read Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Now Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. You remember Saul was originally his name. Jesus changed his name to Paul. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, and he went to the high priest. And he asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that's what he referred to as Christians, based on Jesus' statement, I am the way. If he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it happened that as he was approach, approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, enter the city, and, I will tell, and it will be told to you what you must do. Now the men who traveled with him stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him that he might regain his sight. But Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man and how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed, and he entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up, and he was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Pray with me this morning. Father, thank you for this pointed reminder in the life of Paul that if you can save him, if you can use him, then you can certainly work in our lives. And Father, I pray as we look at this, this amazing, dramatic moment in his life there on the road to Damascus. Lord, as your spirit teaches us in these next few moments, Father, would you help us to hear what you have? Would you help us to be responsive to you? Lord, would you help us not, not to just hear these things and let them just run through like a spaghetti strainer, but Father, help us to, to hang on. 
to meditate on these truths and say, in what ways you did such a dramatic thing in Saul's life, what could you do in my life? Father, challenge us in these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here's our big idea this morning, that if God can save and transform and use Paul, he's got this background, he's got this, these things that happened in his life that are absolutely beyond probably whatever, whatever any of us have ever done. And if God can save him, and God can transform him, and God can use him, then he can certainly do that for you. I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the announcements that you can find a downloadable version for the note-taking guide there in version. It's also available on our website. If you want to pull it down from there, it comes down in a, in a Word version if you want to use that and follow along in the note-taking guide. But I want us to kind of just pick that statement apart. In the next couple of minutes, look at this, this, this event that happened in Paul's life there on the road to Damascus, this incredible moment of interaction with, with the Lord Jesus. And I want to just see how God in his grace did those things, how in his grace he saved Paul, how in his grace he transformed him, and how in his grace he empowered him to serve the Lord. And so I want us to see first God's saving grace. What's the worst thing you've ever done in your life? Don't say it. You may, not want to, you may not want to admit it out loud in church, but think for a minute. What's the worst thing you've ever done in your life? You got it? And it might be, it might be a long list. Maybe there's a lot of list of little things. But as you think about that thing you've done in your life, I want you to realize this, that no matter what it is, no matter what it is that your past looks like, no matter how long that list of things or that, that one thing that immediately popped into your mind, no matter what it is, Paul's past was far worse than yours. I can guarantee it. I don't think any of us have on our list the things that Paul did, the things that he was involved in, no matter what you thought of when I said that. Think of the worst thing you've ever done. Paul's past was far worse than yours. I can guarantee it. Look there again at verses 1 and 2 in Acts chapter 9. It says, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he asked for these letters from the high priest so that if he found any belonging to the way, he might bind them and bring them to Jerusalem. He's, not, he's consumed by his hatred, both for Jesus and anyone who would follow him. And he asks for these letters so that he can go hunt down Christians in Damascus. Now, he's, he's not just standing on the sidelines, just sort of annoyed at believers. I can't believe they're following him. That guy's dead. Why in the world are they following him? He's not just annoyed at them. He's doing anything he can, going out of his way to chase believers down, to drag them in to Jerusalem to be put in prison. And we get a sense of his hatred there at the end of chapter 7, the beginning of chapter 8. There's, there's a story there, the account. We're going to look at this next week, the next hero of the faith. Spoiler alert. We're going to look at the man Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church. And we, we, his, his story, how, how he became the first martyr there at the end of Acts chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. But we get a sense of Paul's hatred. Now here's what's happening. Stephen is preaching. And the council of religious leaders are furious with him because he's preaching Christ. And, and he says there down at the end of, of chapter 7, verse 56 in chapter 7, he, be, he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they're just, they're just enraged at him. And so they, they stone Stephen. And there at the beginning of chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. The apostle Paul, standing there, probably the leader of that contingent, is absolutely in agreement. And we get a sense of the, his, just the degree of his hatred. Look at verse 3 of Acts chapter 8. Then right after that, Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women that he would put them in prison. And he was like a wild animal, consumed with rage and consumed with hate. It was like the very air he breathed. He said he was breathing out threats and murder. That's the depth of his hatred. That's the, the depth of his anger towards believers. And I guarantee whatever you have done is not worse than that. That our past, no matter how bad it is, is not worse than his. And listen, Satan wants, wants you to believe the lie. And Francis Chan's talking about lies that people who may or may not be Christians believe every day. But I, but I can tell you that there are born-again believers that are falling for Satan's lie on a regular basis. 
that you're too bad for God to use. That you've done too much for God to use. Okay, he might have saved you. Okay, I'll give him that, but he cannot use you. Those things on your list of things that you've done are too bad. But I can guarantee you, no matter how bad your past was, Paul's, was that was times worse than that. And keep reading. The story doesn't end there. We don't just get this sense of, of the incredible hatred of Paul, of the fact that he's breathing, out mets, he's breathing out threats and murder. He's chasing down the church. The story goes on, verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice and say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So God doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. God in his grace, he wants to save us in his grace, but he's not going to turn a blind eye to sin. He's not going to pretend it's not there. He's not just going to forget about it. He's not just going to plug his ears and say, la, 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 I'm not listening. And in his grace, he's not forgetting about our sin. He doesn't turn away from it. He holds Paul accountable. He doesn't hide the fact that he's displeased with what Paul has done. But here's the thing. God's grace was greater than Paul's sin. You know, we used to sing that hymn back in the day, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. And I guarantee Paul's sin was great, but God's grace was greater. And you know what? It's greater than yours too. No matter what that sin is, now that doesn't give us license to sin. That's not for us to say, well, listen, God's grace is always going to be greater than my sin, so I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. But it should drive us and compel us to chase after him, this God who loves us that much. Romans chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. I bolded verse 20 because I want us to stand out. I want us to think about it. Paul said this, he said, The law that came in so the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abound all the more. Listen, you and I will dig some pretty deep holes in our lives. And we, we will follow, fall in the depths of those pits of sin, but God's grace is always greater. God's grace will always exceed the, any, any amount of sin that we can get ourselves in. And then verse 6, Paul's story goes on. Jesus said to him, get up, enter the city, we told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. It is a very humbling thing for us to be confronted with our sin. A very humbling thing to stand before God and realize the depth of our sin. And here's this man who just moments before was like a, a raging bull charging at the church. And now, he, now he's like a helpless little child has to be led around by the hand like a, like a helpless little child. And it's a humbling thing. Every one of us is, has to be broken before God for us to realize the depth of our need, for us to realize the greatness of His grace. That's exactly what happens to Saul. And when we realize the depth of our sins, the reality of it, we stand before God and realize His goodness and His love and His grace. It's a humbling, broken moment for us. I think this is one of the greatest pictures of God reaching out in grace to sinful man. So Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. God always takes the initiative in our salvation. We sang in that song just a few minutes ago, there is no door he won't kick down to come after you. God takes the initiative in bringing grace to us. I think this is one of the, the most tremendous pictures of that. How the Lord Jesus chases Saul down on the road to Damascus. What a beautiful picture. God showing his grace in Paul's life and showing it to us. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been mean to somebody? I mean, rude. You know what I'm talking about. Just mean and rude and just almost uncalled for mean. And then they're nice to you afterwards. Isn't that the worst, right? You're mean to them and then, they're, then, they, then they, they respond. They should respond in kind, right? They should respond mean, or, but they don't. They're nice to you back. And that, that really just kind of makes you agitate a little bit more. That's grace. That's what it looks like. When, when we don't deserve someone to respond nicely, when we, when we deserve them to respond back to us the same way we act towards them. And listen, we enter this world as sinners. 
And you and I don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve His grace. We don't deserve His Son. We don't deserve heaven. Not one of us does. But that's God's grace. That's His grace in our lives. What we deserve is condemnation and punishment and eternity separated from Him. That's what all of us deserve. But in His grace, He sent Jesus to die for us. To give us what we don't deserve. To give us what we cannot earn. And that is forgiveness and restoration unto Him. We see the first thing in, in the work that God is doing in Paul's life, we see his saving grace. The second thing we see, though, is God's transforming grace. He doesn't end there. He just I saved, I saved Saul, that's it, I'm just going to let him go on his own. There's a, there's a transforming work he's doing in Paul's life. And from this point forward, when you read through the New Testament, from this point forward, it's night and day. The difference that, that God made in Paul's life is absolutely dramatic. You almost look at him and say, later on, as you read his letters, is this the same guy who was breathing out murderous threats against the church? Could it be the same guy? This is an election year. And I am a news and politics junkie. I'm, I'm sick of it. Are y'all sick of it hearing the talk about politics? You get, on, you get on social media, it's flooded with political stuff and the news constantly talking about politics. Are y'all sick of the election year before it even comes around, right? We're just tired of it by the time it happens. And I am too, but I can't stop. I'm like, I'm like drawn to it like a moth to a porch light. I have to read it every day. I mean, it just makes me so mad, but I'm almost tired of it. But every candidate, you know, every time an election comes around, doesn't matter what kind of election it is, Congressional, presidential, doesn't make any difference. Every candidate tells us the exact same thing. I'm going to solve all of your problems. That last person, they didn't get it right, but trust me, I'm going to get it right and solve every one of your problems. But listen, after 10,000 years of humans occupying this planet, we are still tripping over the same old nonsense we've been tripping over since the very beginning. And for Christianity, we come to a real genuine relationship with Christ. It's not about putting on window dressing. Put on lipstick on a pig. That's how we'd say it in the military. It's not about putting window dressing up. Just making ourselves look better. Just a new way to, to go after old sin. It's not about that. Not about a, a new program. Christianity, a real genuine relationship with Christ, isn't window dressing. It's a complete and utter transformation. Everything is new. Everything is changed. From this point forward in Paul's life, he was a completely different person. He went from this guy who was chasing down the church to this prolific church planter and preacher. Dramatic change, a complete and utter transformation. Now listen, if you had asked Saul when he was along the road, if you had ridden up on your horse right next to him and you said, Saul, why are you doing what you're doing? He would have said to you, I'm doing the work of God. I'm doing the work, I'm doing righteous work here. And I can't help but just imagine how, how easy it is for us to get utterly upside down, so out of sync, so out of step with how God thinks, how easy it is. Paul thought he was doing the work of God. And how easy it is for us to fall into the same trap. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul said this. He said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, he said there in verse 9. Listen how easy it is for us to be deceived, to think like the world thinks, to follow after the desires of our sinful heart. He said, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate or homosexuals or thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, such were some of you. He said, listen, you all used to live there. And you can look at that list and you might be able to pull one or two off that list and say, oh, it was me. I was there. And how easy it is for us to be deceived and get so upside down in our thoughts about who, how, what God wants from us. He said, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. You're changed. That list might have represented you at one point in time, but it doesn't anymore. 
There is a whole new reality in your life now. There's an utter transformation. And listen, when we're doing those things, if someone comes up alongside, it's just like hypothetically, we might ask Saul, Saul, why are you doing those things? When we were doing those things, we thought they were right. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been doing them. Or at least acceptable. We convinced ourselves they were okay. How upside down and out of step we can get with God. The scripture says the heart of man is deceitful, desperately wicked. And how easy it is for us to get so out of sync, so far away from what he wants. And that's why we need a complete reset. We can't just put window dressing on our lives. A new set of rules, a new set of doing things. Here, follow these rules, not those rules. We need a complete transformation from the inside out. Look at what happened to Paul down in verse 15. The Lord said to him, Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel, and I'll show him how much he must suffer for my sake. From that moment forward, Paul, the one who had been the persecutor of the church, is now the greatest preacher in the church. Paul, the one who was causing so much suffering for the followers of Christ, would now willingly suffer himself for the cause of Christ. It's a dramatic transformation. It's not just a little change. Now, what happened to Paul is unique. That's one of the reasons why it grabs our attention when we read it. Not all of us are going to have a, a transformation experience, a salvation experience like Paul did there on the road to Damascus. And that's okay. I know often we think, well, I don't have a testimony like that. You know, my, my testimony, in comparison to Paul, my testimony is kind of boring. So I, I, don't, I don't think God can use it. I don't think I can share it. It'll speak to anybody. Most people have a life just like yours. In comparison to Paul, a little bit boring. And, and your testimony speaks directly to their circumstances, directly to their heart. What happened to Paul is unique, but, it, it, but in, it's an illustration in one sense of what happens in the lives of every single one of God's children. Transformation is by God's initiation. He, he chased Paul down. He was the one that made the first move. He's the one that made the first move in your life. It's by God's initiation, but it's his expectation for us to continue the transformation process, to be involved in it, to cooperate with him in the work that he's doing. God initiates it for Paul, verses 10 through 12. He gives a vision to this man, Ananias, and says, go find this guy named Saul. He gives a vision to Saul, this guy named Ananias is going to come to see you. God began the work of transformation in Paul's life. And Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to the things of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word renewing there, it means renovation. Now, if you've been away because of COVID for a little while, maybe you missed the announcement on Facebook. We are moving, changing locations. We've got a new location. It's kind of right across the street here, the second floor of this Capolino furniture store. And on that floor, they're doing a complete renovation for us to move in. And I've been looking at it. I put some pictures up a couple weeks ago on Facebook. A couple of the walls were up. It's sort of exciting to see happen. And I was up there this week. They're almost finished. And to look at it, it used to be this giant warehousey looking space, just a complete open floor with nothing. Now it's a church. And when you look at it, you can, you can scarcely see what it used to look like. You look at this, the sanctuary and the classrooms and all that stuff, and, and it's hard to imagine what the old thing looked like now. A complete and utter transformation. That's what Paul said here. Be transformed by that kind of renovation in your mind. A complete change. God is faithful to do His part. But you and I, we can't continue to feed our sinful desires. To, to feed our sinful thoughts and feed our sinful actions and say, oh well, God's not finished with me yet, so it's okay. Or the work of transformation, that's God's work, so if I'm not there yet, well, it's He, he that hasn't finished it, so it's okay. We have a part to play. We've got to be actively engaged and involved. That's a command. Be transformed. He is transforming us and he, he expects us to be transformed. But we don't have to do it alone. There is God's saving grace in Paul's life and in yours and mine. 
There is his transforming grace in our lives, and then there is his empowering grace. You and I don't have to do this alone. God doesn't save us by his grace, begin the work of transformation by his grace, and then say, good luck with that. I hope you figure it out. There is his empowering grace. His grace empowers us to live this transformed life. One way God empowers us is by putting us in a family. There in verse 17, Ananias calls Saul, Brother Saul. Listen, this is why we've been talking with, with folks that haven't quite made it back to church yet. And I know I'm very much preaching to the choir this morning because you're here. And if there are folks that have a, a valid, they have concerns, health and safety concerns, I don't want to be around groups of people yet, and that's okay. But there are other folks that, that maybe get comfortable with virtual church, and we're trying to not encourage folks, don't get comfortable with virtual church. It's good, but don't get comfortable. We need to be around the people of God. We need to be encouraged to love and good works. Because listen, you're going to run into folks in your work center, in the exchange, out and about, and they're going to encourage you to a lot of things, but I guarantee not all of them are love and good works. We need to be around the people of God to get that kind of encouragement. Because listen, God didn't put us in this church community. This is not a business relationship we have. This is not a transactional thing. This is a family. He calls him Brother Saul. He put us in a, in a family of believers. That's why we do things like one-on-one -on -one discipleship, to make that kind of connection in people's lives. We have men's group and women's group and home groups and lift and the fellowship this afternoon because we're family. The proverb writer said, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, he said, iron sharpens iron. As that happens, one man sharpens another. And listen, for that to take place, you've got to get up close and personal. You've got to get involved. You can't do that from a distance. That's why we do all of those things, because we're a family. To get connected and involved in each other's lives. Let me encourage you, if you haven't plugged into one of those things, or several of those things, to find where you can get connected and find where you can get plugged in. And then the other way that he empowers us is by giving us his Holy Spirit. He puts us in a family, but he gives us of his Holy Spirit. That's one of the ways he, he, he empowers us to live the transformed lives. Verse 17, the last part of it. Ananias says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight and got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. God empowers us with His Spirit. And the job, the role of the Holy Spirit is to help us understand God's Word. You've had those times where you're, you're reading passages of Scripture and you say, God, I just don't get it. Right? I just don't quite understand what it is you're trying to tell me. And it is His Spirit that, that speaks to our spirit that helps us understand those things. His Spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray. You've been in those moments, right, where, where, the, where the, the burdens are just too heavy and the weight is too much and, and you come before God and you want to cry out but you just simply don't know where to begin, right? We've all had those moments. And the Holy Spirit helps us in those moments, helps us learn how to pray. And he gives us power to be witnesses of Jesus, gives us freedom in Christ. He gives us gifts so that each of us, specific abilities to do His work. Because kingdom service is the priority of the transformed life. Listen, it's the priority of God the Father. It's the priority of His Spirit, and it is then the priority of those who have His Spirit. Kingdom service is now the priority of the transformed life. Notice the word immediately. Verse 18, again in verse 20. Listen, God, there was no foot dragging on God's part towards Paul. And there was no foot dragging on, God, on Paul's part towards God immediately. Now, by the time verse 20 rolls around, Paul had been a believer all of a matter of days. And yet he's in the synagogue preaching the word of God. And God used his past. It wasn't, it wasn't something, an anchor that always held him down. God used that past in Paul's life to preach powerfully. 
In fact, you can imagine the people. They said, this was the guy who was persecuting. The churches in Galatia pointed that out. Isn't this the one who was persecuting Christians? And here he is preaching the gospel. What a powerful way God used him. When immediately he got down to business and said, Lord, what is it you've saved me to do? He'd say this, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. He said, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. This is now my priority. This is now the main thing in my life, to preach the gospel, to be involved in the work of God. It's what he saved me for. It's what he's equipped me to do. I can't not do it. Woe to me if I don't do it. And there are always opportunities to be involved, to reach this community, to bring God's message of hope here to Aviano and to wherever he takes us. When we, There's always opportunities to be involved. And he's changed you. He saved you for that purpose. He's changed you and is, is changing you for that purpose. He is empowering you for that purpose. And the question that we have to all ask ourselves is, will I answer the call? Will I respond to what God is doing in my life? Will I cooperate with the work, the transforming work he's doing in my life? Will I cooperate with that? Now, God has brought us to an amazing part of the world. And I'm not saying don't travel, don't go out and see it. You've got to be at church every moment of every day. That's not what I'm saying. God has brought us to an amazing place here. And we get to see things and experience things that most of our friends and family in the States just dream about being able to see and experience. Go. Check it out. Do it. But also make your spiritual walk a priority of your time while you're here. I've said this a number of times. I think that the greatest opportunity missed for us is if we leave this place and our passport is full of stamps, but our spiritual life is as empty or emptier than when we came. And is serving the Lord, is being plugged into the work that he's doing here, is it as high a priority for you as travel is? Your leisure time while you're here. And I know I might step on a toe or two here in our virtual audience this morning. But I know there are a lot of times where we will cancel going to church because there's that trip that I want to go on this weekend. But let me ask you this. Would you cancel that trip in order to come to church? Would you cancel that trip to be involved in something God wants you to do that weekend? Is serving the Lord, is being about His work that high a priority on your list? And it's a kingdom priority. Kingdom service is a priority of the transformed life. It's what He saved us and empowered us to do we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, it is both unique and common at the same time. It's unique in the sense that God did things in him and for him that you and I will never experience. But it's common in the sense that the same God who saved the Apostle Paul, the same God who did such a dramatic transformation in the life of Paul, the same God who empowered him for such tremendous work is still at work in this world and he's at work in you and he's at work in me. And if he can do that for Paul, if he can save Paul, and transform Paul, and empower Paul, and use him for such an amazing impact in his kingdom, if he can do that in Paul's life, he can do it in yours, and he can do it in mine. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, you are absolutely amazing. And I never get tired of seeing you at work. I never get tired of seeing you taking a broken vessel, a clay pot, something completely ordinary, and doing something absolutely extraordinary with it. And Father, we come before you this morning, a room full of broken clay pots. But Father, we know in your hands, in the hands of the Master, with your saving grace and your transforming grace and your empowering grace at work in our lives, Father, we can accomplish far, far more things than we could ever hope or think or imagine. And Father, I pray that this, this time we've spent looking at Paul, it wouldn't be something where we just say, well, that's nice. I'm glad that happened. It was a good day at church today. But Lord, you would just, you would convict our hearts, continue to work in our hearts and help us to be responsive to you. 
that we would see this kind of transformation. We would see you work in ways in us and through us that it just absolutely blow our minds. Father, thank you for involving us in the things that you're doing here. And Father, I pray as we prepare to leave this place, as we prepare to go right now, Father, I just pray that you would go with us this ever sense of a priority of what you are doing and what you want to do through us in your kingdom. Father, thank you for meeting here with us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to dismiss in just a moment. And if you have questions, if you want to talk to someone about your relationship with Christ, maybe you were sitting there this morning, the Spirit of God was, was speaking to your heart, and you say, you know, I'm not entirely certain about my salvation. And if I were to die right now, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I'm going to hang out after the service down front here for a few minutes. And if you want to talk to someone about your relationship with Christ, just come down and say, I want to talk about Jesus. That's all, that's all you need to say. And I'll be glad to introduce you to this one who can bring this saving grace to play in your life. Or maybe you want to talk with somebody or pray with somebody about something else. Maybe there's some area of your life you know God's been calling you, you know He's equipped you and empowered you, but you've been resistant. You've been pushed and say, Lord, I don't really want to do that. I don't really know how that's going to work out. And you want, you want to just talk or pray with someone about that, I'll be available after the service for that as well. Or contact me later, pastor at avianobaptist.church, or hit me up on Facebook Messenger or on WhatsApp. We're glad you were here this morning, glad we had the opportunity to worship together. And just as a reminder, as we dismiss our time, we have to use those two exits only in the back there. And so I do hope you have a wonderful, blessed week, and we're glad you joined us today. God bless you, we're dismissed. Mask, where's my mask?